Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Monica Pika. I'm with Saks Healthcare, and I will be your technical producer for today's webinar. Firstly, on behalf of Philips and Saks Communications, we want to thank all the frontline workers in our audience for your commitment and passion in helping all of us through this very difficult time. We are truly indebted to all of you. I also want to show our audience how you can send in questions throughout the webinar. So before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping details. You may ask a question at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the Q&A box located on the right side of your screen and pressing Enter. Our speakers will try to answer as many questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. If you experience technical difficulties, please use the Tech Support tab also located on the right side of your screen. If you have trouble seeing the slides at any time during the presentation, please press F5 to refresh your screen if you're using a PC, or Command R if you're using your Mac, or change browsers. Please note that if you are behind a firewall, you will not be able to view the slides. Today's webinar is being recorded, and an online archive of today's event will be available soon after the session. Our moderator today is Dean Hess. Dr. Hess has over 45 years of experience in respiratory care, including clinical, research, teaching, and administrative responsibilities. He is Managing Editor of Respiratory Care, a lecturer at Northeastern University, and a respiratory therapist at Massachusetts General Hospital. His academic interests include aerosol delivery techniques, adult mechanical ventilation, and critical care monitoring. He is a fellow of the American Association for Respiratory Care and the American College of Critical Care. Welcome. Thank you very much, Monica, for that uh, very uh, nice introduction. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending upon where you might be. The title of today's webinar is High Flow Therapy and Non-Invasive Ventilation in COVID-19 Patients. Our presenter this afternoon is a friend and a colleague who I am pleased to introduce, Tom Perino. Tom is a registered respiratory therapist working at Kingston General Hospital in Ontario and a research collaborator at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, working with Dr. Laurent Brouchard. He is also a lecturer adjunct for the Department of Anesthesia, Division of Critical Care at McMaster University. He has spoken at more than 50 conferences authored research, editorials, and textbook chapters. He has also won numerous awards and recognitions for his contributions to respiratory care. Thomas has disclosed the following relevant financial relationships. Those are with Drager, Fisher and Peichel, and Phillips. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour for nurses and respiratory therapists. A link to obtain credit will be available at the end of the webinar. And support for this educational activity is provided by Philips. So thanks to Philips for that support. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Tom to address the very timely topic of high flow therapy and non-invasive ventilation in COVID-19 patients. Tom, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Dean, for the nice introduction. And let's get started. So the learning objectives for the presentation today will be to describe the initial concerns of using high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation in COVID-19 associated respiratory failure. Describe what evidence exists for non-COVID-19 respiratory failure support with high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation. And then present clinical concepts related to using high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation in COVID-19 patients presenting with respiratory failure. Let's first start, uh, start off with a very hot topic, aerosol versus dispersion. I think there's a big confusion about these two terms out there in the world, uh, there appears to be a misunderstanding between what aerosol generation is and what aerosol dispersion is. There have been concerns regarding medical procedures that generate aerosols, and the dispersion of those aerosols, of course, is different as it's the distance that these particles will travel. So many centers around the world, when faced with the issue with COVID-19 and the possibility of transmitting infection through aerosols, 
many hospitals decided against the use of high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation in favor of normal oxygen therapy devices like non-rebreather masks, nasal cannula, et cetera. What we've now discovered, and even early data in the beginning suggested this, that we didn't have solid information suggesting that these therapies actually generated aerosols. So this is an online ahead of print publication. I've chosen the most recent publication to discuss, but there are others brief before this. And they assessed, they assessed volunteers with normal breathing, talking, deep breathing, and coughing. And they compared room air, nasal cannula at four liters per minute, a face mask at 15 liters per minute, and then high flow nasal cannula at 10, 30, and 50. Also non-invasive ventilation at 12 over five and 20 over 10. And if you look at the graphs here, you can see there's actually no difference in the amount of aerosol production. So the number of aerosol particles generated across devices, there's no significant difference in terms of aerosol generation. And the <clears throat> size of the aerosols, again, not significantly different. So this again supported this concept that high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation probably shouldn't be grouped into its own category or in a separate category as an aerosol generating procedure as aerosols are not clearly generated. However, dispersion is something different. So this is another paper, again, the most recent of papers that have discussed dispersion. There are more than a few on, on online available for reading, but this is another reason recent one looking at the quantitative assessment of viral dispersion associated with respiratory support devices in a simulated critical care environment. They tested all of these uh, areas. So the bedside healthcare provider, someone working directly at the head of the bed in terms of like an airway expert at the end of the bed, at the foot of the bed, side of the bed. So you can see the yellow dots represent all the areas where they measured the dispersion of, of aerosol particles. And when they compared them, so the blue dot here is invasive ventilation, which is the lowest, as you can imagine, because the patient has an endotracheal tube, there should not be uh, aerosol droplets being generated. And then the red dot or red line, it bar graph is helmet with a peep valve. So of course, this is a device that covers the entire head of the patient during non-invasive ventilation. And then the green is BiPAP, so normal non-invasive ventilation with an inspiratory pressure and an expiratory pressure. The purple is a non-rebreather mask, pink is nasal prongs, and green is high flow nasal cannula. And as you can see, all of these devices disperse aerosols. Again, this is different than generating them. And actually, if you look at nasal prongs, which is the pink line, compared to high flow nasal cannula, if you are considering isolating a patient on high flow or treating a patient re receiving high flow nasal cannula different than one just receiving nasal prongs, um, you're putting yourself up for some issues if you are treating them different from an infection control standpoint. So really the issue of singling out high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation in the form of BiPAP as these devices that should be considered extremely dangerous to use, whereas using a non-rebreather mask and nasal prongs were not considered this, really the data does not support that they should be treated differently. So the take home message with all of this is that avoidance of high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation is actually not based on the current available evidence. And data does not support the criteria of aerosol generating and dispersion is what is increased compared to spontaneous breathing. And these things need to be considered. So in summary, protect yourself with proper PPE regardless of the oxygen delivery device. Simple devices have similar dispersion to high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation. So, Another hot topic in this subject of COVID-19 is early versus late intubation. Studies have been published comparing early versus late, and some studies have shown worse outcomes for late intubation. Some other, other ones have shown worse outcomes for early intubation, and some have shown no difference between early and versus late. However, you have to consider the study in which you're reading and the limitations of these studies. So many of these studies are retrospective in nature. They're not randomized. Late intubations may be due to progression of illness, not necessarily that they're sitting on a patient for long or too long. We need to pay close attention to the admission to intubation time between groups. Um, and many of the studies didn't have clear definition for an intubation criteria. So is someone delayed because of the clinical decision not to intubate them? Or did they have no clinical criteria for intubating? So it's kind of a free for all. And this, these are all important things for trying to determine whether or not there is a true problem with early versus late intubation. 
But one of the points I want to add, or not add, but clarify here, the close attention from admission to intubation is important because in some, some studies, early versus late, were patients that were intubated in less than two days and those that were intubated greater than two days. So someone intubated on day two versus someone intubated on day three would have been categorized separately in this comparison. So it's important to understand that there's a limitation when you have to actually choose a cutoff between what is early and what is late. There's going to be people that are around the, the switchover of that, of that um, limitation and or sorry of that criteria and therefore it may not give us a full picture. Now intubation criteria, this is just an example. This is taken from a high nasal cannula study which I'll describe later. But decreased level of consciousness, a cardiac arrest or severe hemodynamic instability would be criteria for intubating a patient or persisting or worsening respiratory condition defined as at least two of the following criteria. So failure, failure to achieve a PO2 um, that's greater than 60 um, and SATs greater than 90. So if your PO2 is less than 60 and your SATs are less than 90, despite being on high flow greater than 30 liters per minute with an FiO2 of 1, which would be 100% oxygen, respiratory acidosis with a pH less than 7 to 5, a respiratory rate greater than 30, or the inability to clear secretions. So any two of these criteria are examples of things that people could utilize as decisions to intubate. Now the respiratory rate greater than 30, this was used in a study. I'm not suggesting this criteria, I'm just giving an example of criteria. Other studies have used respiratory rates as high as 40, and I'll discuss one of those uh, that study later. Some other people have considered using scores. This is an ex example published in, um, <clears throat> in 2020 uh, by Rola and colleagues looking at a decision to intubate, perhaps looking at other parameters, not just respiratory rate, but refractory or, or sorry, retraction or accessory muscle use. And then the overall state of the patient, are they very anxious, very agitated? So looking at more than just clinical numbers, um, like a saturation or a respiratory rate or how much FiO2 they're on. So yes, consider respiratory rate, but what about muscle use? Uh, do they compare, appear to be completely comfortable? And then looking at the overall state of the patient in terms of their, their um, agitation and whether or not you feel like there's an impending doom or they feel that there's an impending doom. But often it's this idea of including more than just one piece of information. We don't just intubate patients based on one criteria. Now, one of the things I wanna bring to light <clears throat> is how much oxygen the patient's on. We need to consider something very simple to determine in terms of PF ratio. If your PO2 is less than the percent oxygen you are on, then we need to consider that their PF ratio is less than or equal to 100. And this is considered when someone's intubated and has bilateral infiltrates, this is considered, or in their on PO5, this is considered ARDS. So an example is if you need more oxygen than your PO2 is. So if you're on let's say 70% O2 and your PO2 is 60, this is a PF ratio less than 100. This is a very severe hypoxemic patient. So we need to really be closely considering these patients. Patients that sit on 100% oxygen for long periods of time, not only do they likely have a PF ratio that's less than 100, but there's also other problems. And this is just one example, just showing that the applying high levels of oxygen can reduce, and this is a study done in um, a children, it's a double-blind randomized control trial, just looking at the effect of low versus high FiO2, and what has been known for years, that high levels of FiO2 will cause um, things like denitrogenation washout, so a, a nitrogen washout, absorption atelectasis, so it can reduce FRC. This was also tested in um, adult patients, and they found that whether you compare 60% FiO2 or 100% FiO2, there will be a significant reduction in FRC, which can be maintained with PEEP when they're on a ventilator. So you can adjust for this or maintain FRC when you're applying positive end expiratory pressure. But of course, high nasal cannula, although it can generate some pressures, it's not really considered a device that can maintain positive end expiratory pressure, similar to that of an intubated patient. So being on a high level of FiO2 for long periods of time may worsen that electasis by lowering FRC and then the patients really have no reserve. And what you'll find is after a few days of being on 100% oxygen, the patients no longer tolerate turns. You start to, the, with nursing care, they desaturate very quickly. They're slow to recover. Again, they don't have the FRC available for easy recovery of these, of these maneuvers.
So let's discuss the evidence for non-invasive ventilation and high nasal cannula in general, not just with COVID-19 patients, but just what do we have to date in terms of how we should manage patients in respiratory failure. I'm going to focus mostly on hypoxemic failure because this is typically how COVID-19 patients present, unless they have an underlying issue with COPD in which they would follow the criteria that probably non-invasive ventilation would be better. So in terms of the level of guidance that's out there, the current guidelines for adult non-invasive ventilation the highest level of confidence we have with using non-invasive ventilation is with hypercapnic COPD exacerbation, cardiogenic pulmonary edema also, to, there's a recommendation to do it, and then you have a list post-operative patients, palliative, etc. Now when we're talking about hypoxemic patients, you have to consider the cause. If the cause is pulmonary edema, we have clear evidence that we should be trying non-invasive ventilation. If they're immunocompromised patient, we can attempt it. There's more data suggesting high nasal cannula may be better than non-invasive ventilation extubating patients, so post-extubation um, risk, so it, extubating someone directly to non-invasive, there's evidence for that. Uh, post-extubation failure hours later, there's a recommendation not to do it. Um, but when you look down and you keep going down, there's a few non-recommendations. So one is pandemic viral illness, uh, which we're dealing with right now. The reason why there's no recommendation is because simply we did not have sufficient data when they present these guidelines, they did not have sufficient data to determine a recommendation for or against the use of non-invasive ventilation in a pandemic viral illness. So it's not that they recommend against it or for it, they have insufficient data to make a recommendation. And then the one above the pandemic viral illness is de novo respiratory failure, which I normally make the joke that I'm not sure most respiratory therapists know what de novo means, um, but it's been on these non-invasive recommendations for the last few years. So de novo hypoxemic respiratory failure is hypoxemic respiratory failure in the absence of underlying chronic lung disease or cardiac failure. So again, if you have chronic lung disease like COPD or you have cardiac failure and you have CHF or pulmonary edema, this, if you're hypoxic due to those conditions, clearly this isn't a reason to use non-invasive ventilation. So you should use non-invasive ventilation in those cases. But if it's hypoxemic respiratory failure in the absence of those, this is considered de novo. And again, there's not a recommendation for or against. There's just no recommendation because there's so many things to consider. We have evidence suggesting that um, there are ways to approach this, uh, this man these managements of these types of patients, but they did not provide a recommendation to do it because of the complications associated with it, which I'll discuss in a moment. So one of the issues why it's important to understand patients with or without chronic disease is that there actually is a difference. So pneumonia would be a perfect example of a de novo hypoxemic respiratory failure. Someone comes in, they have pneumonia, it's, and if they don't have chronic lung disease, there actually is a difference than those with chronic lung disease. So on the table that is on the screen, on the left, you can see patients with COPD. And if you look at the percent of patients that avoided intubation, it's just down the left there, you can see avoided intubation. And... <clears throat> You can see there is a significant difference of patients. In fact, 100% of the patients in this small study um, avoided intubation when given non-invasive ventilation. When they compared it to standard treatment, there was a significant difference. Patients did not avoid intubation, just getting oxygen therapy. And when you look at patients without COPD, you can see there's no difference between those that were given non-invasive ventilation or standard treatment. Now, there is a higher um, percentage in the avoided intubation, but again, it's not significant. Again, small numbers of patients, but this just, again, demonstrates the point that providing non-invasive ventilation for hypoxemic failure due to a pneumonia in patients without COPD doesn't necessarily make a difference. It doesn't help. So it doesn't avoid intubation like it does if they have COPD. Now let's look at the most, this is one of the more recent uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, non-invasive ventilation in acute hypoxemic non-hypercapnic respiratory failure. I'm going to read half of the conclusion and then show you the rest of it in just on the next slide. But the first part sounds very promising. Non-invasive ventilation decreased endotracheal intubation rates and hospital mortality in acute hypoxemic non-hypercapnic respiratory failure, excluding chronic obstructive pulmonary disease exacerbation and cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So this sounds very positive that non-invasive ventilation decreased endotracheal intubation in de novo hypoxemic respiratory failure because it has, again, chronic pulmonary or cardiac issues. The next part of the conclusion is there is no sufficient scientific evidence to recommend bilevel of positive airway pressure, this is non-invasive ventilation or helmet, due to the limited number of trials available large rigorous randomized trials are needed to answer these questions definitely. So again, there appears to be studies that demonstrate a reduction in endotracheal intubation, 
but many of the studies are very different in their methods. Some use helmets, some do not. And so because of all this information, we need to understand that we don't have significant data to suggest that it should be a first line of defense for hypoxemic respiratory failure, particularly in patients that do not have underlying chronic disease. So we need to know the risk factors. If we are working in an institution that uses non-invasive ventilation, we need to be very aware as clinicians, what are the risk factors? So a risk factor for failing non-invasive ventilation, a PF ratio less than 150 is a risk factor for failing non-invasive ventilation. Very easy to calculate. You take your PO2, you divide it by your FiO2 as a fraction, and you get this value. Severity scores are not often calculated by clinicians at the bedside. They're used a lot for research, but I don't, I've not met respiratory therapists that don't work in research that have ever calculated a SAPS2, a SOFA score, or an Apache 2 score. But of course, this just implies that the more severely sick someone is with multi-organ dysfunction, the more likely they are to fail therapy. This makes sense. Tidal volume greater than nine mils per kilo. Now this paper that, these two papers that looked at this value here, they use non-invasive ventilation on ventilators with a dual limb circuit. And I have an image down on the bottom, which was included in a paper written by Dean uh, in 2013 that shows non-invasive ventilation to delivered by a ventilator with a dual limb circuit. You can measure more accurately the exhaled tidal volume. And that's what they did in this study. So it was greater than nine mils per kilo of exhaled tidal volume was this cutoff for risk of failure. Age over 40, which years ago used to sound like something that I didn't have to worry about, and now I do. Etiology, community acquired pneumonia, ARDS, or immunosuppression. So again, having pneumonia is an increased risk of failure, particularly in patients that do not have hypercapnic respiratory failure. A HACOR score greater than five, which I'll describe in a moment, is another risk factor that we could look at clinically at the bedside with very easily attainable data. Now, the mortality risk, again, similar mortality risks, but two that I want to highlight, delaying intubation more than 12 hours. So someone who you know is going to need to intubate and you sit on them for longer, if you wait more than 12 hours, patients that are intubated later when they meet criteria for failure do worse. They have a mortality risk. And then failing non-invasive ventilation also is associated with higher mortality. So we really want to try to avoid delaying intubation and waiting till they fail because patients that fail or are delayed intubation have worse outcomes. And of course, age also plays a role here. So in terms of delaying intubation, again, what's interesting, this difference between those with previous cardiac or respiratory disease and those that do not, if you compare de novo patients, timing to intubation has a significant, there's a significant difference. So those that were either survived or died, um, Patients that died had a longer time towards intubation in patients with de novo acute respiratory failure. So again, this association between how long they were on non-invasive before they failed had a higher mortality rate. But in patients who were not de novo, so patients with cardiac or respiratory disease, there actually, the timing did not actually, there was no difference in timing between those that survived and those that did not uh, when receiving non-invasive ventilation. So again, very important, if they don't have underlying cardiac or respiratory disease, we need to consider the time in which we keep sitting on them and waiting for them to fail, uh, this could be harmful. So the HACOR score is a score that uses heart rate, acidosis, consciousness, oxygenation, and respiratory rate to predict non-invasive ventilation failure in hypoxemic patients. When you calculate the HACOR score, they have a really excellent um, predictive value with their area under the curve of 0.88 and 0.91, both in their test and validation cohorts. They have good positive predictive value and negative predictive value. So the diagnostic accuracy is good. And this is taking a score within one hour of non-invasive ventilation, specifically in hypoxemic respiratory patients. Again, they did not include those patients with underlying cardiac or COPD issues. So these were patients with without COPD in particular, they were non-hypercapnic patients. They calculate this score within one hour and it was very well, or very good at predicting intubation in these patients with a cutoff point greater than five. What they also found is that when they looked at subgroups of types, so the type of diagnosis, whether it was pneumonia as the cause of um, hypoxemic failure, ARDS, pulmonary cancer, pulmonary embolism, again, the accuracy of its ability to, to distinguish those who required intubation and those who did not remained the same, even heart failure there. So I, I almost made a mistake saying they did not include patients again, with heart failure, but they did have patients with heart failure. They just excluded hypercapnic patients. But in all these subgroups of patients, it still retained this excellent diagnostic accuracy for predicting failure. And 
what's interesting is that even at one hour, 12 hour, 24 hours and 48 hours still retains, but really, really good in that first one hour of use. And what they also found is that patients that met that criteria of having a HACOR score greater than five at one hour of non-invasive ventilation. So after one hour, they had it, they looked at patients. Now, again, this study was not to determine intubating patients. They just looked retrospectively at all their patients and created this score to see whether or not it would have predicted their failure. And what they found in patients that met that score criteria at one hour, if they were not intubated for more than 12 hours, those patients had significantly higher mortality than those that were intubated in less than or equal to 12 hours. So again, delaying intubation also harmful. Now this study, the study I just showed you was a single center study. This is the, this group here looked retrospectively at, I believe, almost 20 years of non-invasive data they had collected and also found excellent um, predictive value at that one hour with a cutoff greater than five. Um, again, suggesting that this is something that we probably should consider looking at clinically. It's a very easy tool. I would like to see more studies utilizing it just to see if it's consistent. Um, we do not have a prospective study using it as a, a intubation criteria compared to not using the score to see if it actually can reduce um, any harmful outcomes, but really interesting score, easy to calculate, and I really suggest taking a look at it. If you are providing non-invasive ventilation in a hyper, or sorry, in, in a hypoxic respiratory failure patient. So just to briefly touch on helmets, um, there was a lot of popularity of helmet, especially early on in the first wave of the pandemic. There were many videos and shots from Italy where they were using these helmets on many, many patients. One of the benefits would be reduced transmission and dispersion. As I showed you in the example slides near the beginning, there's much less dispersion with a helmet because most of the patient's head is covered. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a safety issue related to transmission of infection. Um, in terms of outcomes, it's definitely a feasible therapy. We don't have a lot of data suggesting that it's superior to other forms of data or, or other forms of therapy, I should say. Uh, this is a paper published in 2016 that was a positive study, showed helmets significantly reduced uh, the need for intubation in ARDS patients, so hypoxemic respiratory failure patients treated with non-invasive ventilation via face mask versus helmet. The issue with this study is that it they planned 206 patients. It was stopped early because of the difference that they saw. So they most studies have a safety interim analysis. Unfortunately, it was stopped early, so we only have a small number of patients, but it was stopped for safety reasons. So I would like to see more data. This is one of the reasons why the meta-analysis did not uh, include um, a recommendation because they said even with helmet we don't have a lot of data like this quality data uh, to suggest that we should be moving towards this device and it's not available for every um, every hospital doesn't have this as a go-to therapy but it's definitely growing in popularity since the pandemic and this just shows some of their um, other outcome data so endotracheal intubation was um, less in the helmet group ventilator free days uh, there were more ventilator free days the icu length of stay was less the hospital mortality and 90-day mortality uh, was also lower in the group treated with helmet. Again, very small numbers, 83 patients, but promising. So high flow nasal cannula, now switching gears, really, um, I would say, blew up in the adult field after the publishing of this uh, paper here, the Florale trial published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2015 that compared non-invasive ventilation with standard oxygen and high flow therapy. They found overall um, a difference in mortality be, for high flow nasal cannula being uh, the, the lowest mortality in terms of the therapies provided. Um, but interestingly enough, their primary outcome was intubation. And although they did not find overall a lower rate of intubation, well, it was lower, but it wasn't significant overall. But when they looked at the patients that were more hypoxemic, so patients with a PF ratio less than or equal to 200, there was a significant reduction in the need for intubation. And this likely explains the lower mortality overall um, when they looked at the secondary outcome of mortality. So this really got people excited on high flow nasal cannula. So high flow nasal cannula compared with conventional oxygen therapy, we have a recent systematic review and meta-analysis comparing, again, high flow versus just conventional O2. And there's a few nice things that they found. So right now, I wouldn't say this is a nice thing, but we only have one study showing a reduction in mortality. When you collect the studies that are out there currently. Right now, the mortality, um, so those who aren't familiar with a forest plot, the black diamond should not cross one. 
all the studies above, again, if the line crosses one, then it's not significant <clears throat> in favor of one or the other. So even though the blue dots may land on one side or the other, you don't want the lines to cross. And then the overall effect of all of these studies, the black diamond, you want it to be sitting on one side of one or the other. If it crosses over, it's not significant. So although the diamond is slightly on the left, this is, this is nothing to be um, confident about at all. This just shows that there is no demonstration of mortality benefit yet. We don't have um, any. We don't have enough data to suggest a mortality benefit, but where we do have um, benefit overall. So when they compared studies with a low risk of bias or high risk of bias, you can see that overall, if you look at the black diamond at the bottom, it favors high flow nasal cannula for the reduction in the es in escalation of care. So what's escalation of care? This would be non-invasive ventilation or intubation. And of course, they looked specifically at the need for invasive ventilation. And overall, uh, the diamond is leaning on the side of high flow cannula. This was significant. So again, the need for intubation was also reduced. And when they combined all this information, they found that there was a 4.4% absolute reduction in the need for intubation. So you would need to treat 23 patients before you avoided intubation in one patient. This may sound great, but really a number needed to treat of four would be fantastic for something. Uh, when it's 23, you have to consider, um, for any therapy, if they say the number needed to treat is 23, you have to consider one thing. Is there any harm in treating 23 patients with something before one person benefits? And when it comes down to high flow cannula, they're clearly doesn't seem a harm, seem to be a harm in providing non or high flow nasal cannula. So because there's no harm in providing high flow nasal cannula, it's likely worth providing high flow nasal cannula, knowing that after 23 patients, you're going to reduce an intubation. If there was, if this was a drug, for example, that was potentially harmful, if there was harmful side effects of a drug, you wouldn't want to give 23 patients harmful side effects just so that one person could be saved by it. So depending on what we're talking about, a number needed to treat of 23 may be, may be acceptable or not acceptable. In the case of high flow nasal cannula, it's definitely acceptable. So failure of high flow nasal cannula also um, has, is also um, considered something that we have to worry about delaying. So we know that if we provide non-invasive ventilation, delaying it can have, have problems. This is a study looking at failure of high nasal cannula, so delaying an intubation. Again, where you have worse outcomes is overall mortality, um, successful extubation, so people that are intubated later uh, have less successful extubation, so they have weaning difficulties, and of course, ventilator-free days are also affected. So again, even with high flow cannula, we have to consider that if they meet criteria for intubation, we need to intubate them before they fail, failing intubation, or sorry, failing high flow nasal cannula, because we're delaying intubation is associated with worse outcomes. Again, this is outside of COVID-19. This is just the data we have. And now considerations for COVID-19. There's actually a really good paper published um, that, that discusses high flow nasal cannula, non-invasive ventilation, and awake non-intubated proning in patients with uh, coronavirus disease 2019, so COVID-19 with respiratory failure. Um, this paper was published in CHEST, and they just run through basically criteria for when to use each option. So for simple oxygen supplementation, they're saying, you know, start off with nasal cannula. Sure, you can go to non-rebreather mask, um, but basically, if you have worsening hypoxemia, the non-invasive ventilation strategies would include high flow, awake proning, and non-invasive ventilation. But if you look at the non-invasive ventilation considerations, it says consider helmet if you have it. And then it says COPD with moderate hypercapnia or cardiogenic pulmonary edema or inability to carry out worker breathing and patients with low aspiration risk. So again, leaning on the fact that if they have underlying chronic conditions, non-invasive non ventilation is a good option. Um, without that, it's a little bit more questionable, uh, but clearly an option in patients with COPD um, with hypercapnia or cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So I'm going to go further into this paper here. They discuss the physiological effects. I think most people using high flow know that it's heated high flow. It flushes out the anatomical space of the na nasal pharynx, which can reduce um, physiological dead space. It can reduce worker breathing, they think, related to this mechanism. It can provide a little bit of expiratory pressure. Um, some will say this says, this says four to six. It really does rely on the size of the cannula compared to the size of the nares. So the less space or the higher the cannula size compared to the nares, the more pressure is going to be generated. And this can also be bad for comfort, uh, but good for pressure. Um, again, heating that is important. Awake proning, again, it's just a matter of improving VQ matching in a patient. 
and then non-invasive ventilation with, with or without a helmet. It augments tidal volume. We should know that about positive airway pressure. It can improve alveolar ventilation, so it can lower CO2, so very important for patients with high CO2, like a COPD exacerbation on top of COVID-19. It can increase end expiratory volumes, again, giving that expiratory pressure, and can generate uh, higher airway pressures, um, hence improve P PaO2, and it can reduce worker breathing. So these are, those are the physiological rationales. The indications, uh, again, they cover the indications, which I'm not going to get into, but I will discuss for the helmet, it says for um, respiratory failure, COPD exacerbations, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and greater inspiratory um, pressure provision for patients with, that are failing high flow nasal cannula. So again, consider using it as a strategy for patients who fail high flow nasal cannula, but maybe not as a first line. And then it also suggests in post-extubation patients, both for high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation, which I'll talk about the combination of those two later. Finally, they talk about precautions, which really just come down to ensuring that you're monitoring the patient for signs of failure and that perhaps you're delaying intubation. And one of the things they mentioned for high flow nasal cannula is if the patient's not tolerating it, of course, this is a problem. Um, but the ROX index, which I'm going to discuss, is a very simple to calculate score. And they're saying less than 3.85s at 12 hours may be predictive of failure. I'll talk about the various cutoffs of the ROX index and why they chose 3.85. I think this is a good um, recommendation here. And then for non-invasive ventilation, patients with PF ratio less than 150, again, we're talking about hypoxemic failure. I mentioned this was one of the risk factors for failing non-invasive ventilation. So if you can't improve someone's PF ratio above 150 after trying non-invasive ventilation, then you should consider moving on. In terms of um, settings or technique, high flow, generally between 50 and 60 in these patients is what they're recommending. Starting off with high levels of FiO2 and then weaning down as, as tolerated. Starting with temperatures of 37 degrees, but you may need to adjust it down to 34 or 31, depending on the tolerance of the patient and the device that you have, whether or not you have all three of those temperature settings. For non-invasive ventilation, initiate with a CPAP of 10 and add pressure support on top of that um, if required to reduce respiratory rate. And then again, FiO2 starting high and reducing down, maintaining SATs greater than 92 is their techniques here. But monitoring is the part I wanna talk about before I get into monitoring techniques like the ROX index. I've already talked about the HACOR score, but I'm gonna talk about the ROX index next. But they're saying, you know, check a blood gas within a half an hour. Uh, they say that for both high flow and non-invasive ventilation. So this really, there's a really an importance here in terms of when you start a therapy, the early reassessment of this therapy is actually quite important. So they're suggesting a half an hour. Um, many other papers have looked at that criteria at one hour. And I think this is very important because if we're waiting for six hours to decide whether or not a therapy is working, I think we're missing the point that generally we should have an idea of whether or not this therapy is right within a very short period of time, meaning 30 minutes to an hour. So let's talk about the ROX index. This was a paper published in the Blue Journal in 2019. And what they did is they looked at a patient's, um, they looked at patients prospectively, but they did not use the ROX index to decide intubation. They just, they had a protocol for providing high flow nasal cannula therapy, and they had intubation criteria. If the patient met the criteria, they were encouraged to intubate the patient. And then what they did is they, once they got to 191 patients in this prospective study of just managing patients with high flow nasal cannula, they looked back at the data and then tried to determine whether or not they could predict failure of high flow nasal cannula in specifically pneumonia patients. I have this in red on the screen because hypoxemic failure in this study was caused by pneumonia. And of course, this would be applicable to COVID-19 associated pneumonia. So patients coming in with pneumonia as a definition of failure, they were included in this high flow nasal cannula study. And then they, this was a validation study of a score they had already looked at in data prior to this. So this was their validation study of this score. Many oxygenation variables were assessed and their ability to predict the need for mechanical ventilation were compared. I'll discuss them. They did perform an external validation prospectively with the Florali trial, which is the high flow nasal cannula trial I recently mentioned um, that compared non-invasive ventilation with standard O2 and high flow nasal cannula. With that external validation, it did not perform as well. And they say that this could be related to the fact that the intubation criteria in the Florali trial 
included a respiratory rate greater than 40, and 82% of the patients had pneumonia. So it wasn't exclusively pneumonia patients in the Forale trial. There were a lot. There were 82%. So this is likely likely less of a factor of why it was different, but it's we should consider that 18% of the patients would not have been the types of patients that were included in this study. And of course, they allowed patients to breathe more than 40 before they in intubated. The, that was their respiratory rate criteria. In this study, the, res the respiratory rate criteria, I'll discuss on the next slide, but failure to initiate, um, so respiratory failure, so when they would start high flow are patients that they could not maintain SATs greater than 92 through a face mask of 10 liters per minute of more and the respiratory rate greater than 25, they would then initiate high flow with a minimum flow starting at 30. They would titrate up, get as high as they could for, with, with comfort from the patient and start to get an FiO2 of 100 and then weaning from there. Their intubation criteria is the same intubation criteria I gave earlier as an example. And you'll see number three under the hypoxemic cate category or hypoxia or respiratory condition category, where there needs to be at least two of the following. Respiratory rate greater than 30. And the difference between that and the Florale trial is they allowed up to 40 of a respiratory rate. And since respiratory rate is actually part of the ROCS index, it makes sense that they would have different values associated with failure. And I'm just going to go back two slides to just, I think I totally missed explaining the point that the ROCS index takes your saturation divided by your FiO2 as a fraction and then divide that value by your respiratory rate. So if your SATs were 96 and your FiO2 was 80, it would be 96 divided by 0.8. And you would take that value and divide it by the patient's respiratory rate. Kind of missed explaining that one. <laughs> we'll get it, get into it more again on, this, on the coming slides here. So when they looked at a number of factors, like just taking SAT divided by FiO2, looking at just respiratory rate, only PCO2, the only the flow that they were required, um, the ROCS index, their SATs alone, their FiO2 alone, or their lactate alone, nothing really reached an acceptable predictive value. So the area under the curve is sort of the, the diagnostic accuracy of the test. And really below 0.7 is considered not good at all. 0.7 becomes acceptable. 0.8 becomes uh, good or excellent. And then point, above 0.9 is outstanding. So at 24 hours, the ROCS index gets to a point where it's excellent. It's acceptable at six hours and, and forward. Uh, again, at 12, it's at 0.75 as a um, area under the curve. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk now a little bit about sensitivity and specificity. In the study, they published that a value of 4.88 or greater was able to predict success in patients. So it's important when you look at values, whether or not you're predicting success or predicting failure. So this is how things like sensitivity and specificity are calculated. You'll see all these numbers here. And if you've, never, if you've never calculated or understood sensitivity and specificity, I'll try to explain it simply down here. You have an outcome, which would be in this, in this point would be uh, whether or not they're intubated. So because they're predicting success greater than or equal to 4.88, if the patient was successful and the, the test, which is the ROCS index here, if the ROCS index said they were successful and the patient was actually successful, this percentage is the amount of based on if the patient again was less than that value but they were actually successful these are patients that would be missed by this tool so sensitivity is how many patients are correctly identified as successful and then the failure is this number here would be the percentage of patients that failed and the test accurately predicted that they failed and of course the problem with many tests is that as sensitivity goes up specificity goes down so if you look here at two hours, sensitivity is 69 and specificity is 60. As you get further along, it becomes 83, 86, 87. This is great, the numbers are going up, but this, the specificity is going down. So what does that mean? If this is going down, this means that this number is going up. And all this means is that although you're increasing sensitivity, you're gonna have some patients that you say are successful, but they're going to fail. So you can overdiagnose but you're not as this goes up you're missing less patients so the problem with missing less patients is you may overdiagnose uh success which doesn't really um seem to be a huge issue but it can be of course because if you stop monitoring the patient closely um and because your your tool says they'll be successful but they're actually going to fail this basically means don't walk away from your patient uh, just because you have this number now these are the numbers that are more uh, i think more useful and they mention uh, sorry, this is still predicting success. I'm going to skip this one because this just, I think, complicates the, the discussion, except just to point out that the higher the value is, the ROCS index, obviously the more likely they are to fail. So this is just showing, if you want to be really certain, if you have a value um, you know, greater than eight, there's a very low likelihood of overdiagnosing. So that you're not, if, if it's over eight, they're definitely um, going to be okay. <clears throat> 
and eight to 10 is really that threshold of where you could be pretty certain. Now, this is the more important one. And this is the one, if you recall, their guidelines said less than 3.85 at 12 hours. Now, why did they pick this value? So these values less than 3.85 predict failure. So if you look at my little table down here, now the outcome is failure. And does the test accurately predict failure? And you'll notice the sensitivity is actually really low. So in the validation and the training cohort, it's very low. But this is the important value here, specificity. Why is that? If you say someone's going to fail and they weren't going to fail, the result would be you intubating them. So you do not want to overdiagnose failure. Otherwise, you're going to be intubating patients who would have otherwise been successful just because your test said they were going to fail. So when you use a test for predicting failure, a high specificity is important because you don't want to intubate someone who you think is going to fail based on a test, but they actually would have been okay. This would be a bad thing. So this is why they chose 3.85 at 12 hours. The specificity is so good that 1.6% of patients um, may actually have been successful that were categorized the wrong way. Otherwise, you're not intubating uh, patients that would other by, otherwise be successful. So that's why they use that at 12 hours. And if you use the 3.85, as failure and the 4.88 as success as you'll notice there's a huge gap in between those two lines so the light the light gray line is greater than 4.88 and then the black line is the less than 3.85 and of course the gap between that is that gray area so if your patient has a rocks index within that area we really have a considerable range of uncertainty between those two values so it's important to monitor this calculate it early get that 12-hour value but if the 12-hour value if it's greater than 3.85 but let's say it's 3.98 they're in that gray area so it's really hard to be certain whether or not they're going to be successful clearly close monitoring is important but less than 3.85 at 12 hours a pretty good indication that you probably should intubate this patient now remember pneumonia was the cause of hypoxemic failure for all patients in this ROCS index study. And again, there's just the three thresholds there at two hours, 2.85, at six hours, 3.47, at 12 hours, 3.85. These are the failure uh, predictive values at those ranges there. Again, with very high specificity so that you're not intubating patients who would have otherwise been successful. Um, this is a paper published by Maori and colleagues just suggesting that if you calculate a ROCS index and you're on perhaps a low level of flow like 30, you should first try to increase your flow. So when they increase flow from 30 to 60, you can see that many patients responded with a reduction, uh, sorry, with an increase in the ROCS index. So the higher the ROCS index, the better. And so many patients, when you increase flow, had an increase in the ROCS index. So always attempt to titrate flow before you make a, a clinical decision, but I would not wait another 12 hours to reevaluate it. It would be adjust the flow, wait a few moments, uh, again, recalculate the score. Doesn't require a blood gas. You're just looking at SATs, FiO2, and respiratory rate, but give them time to respond to the increase in flow. And if the respiratory rate is reduced, uh, even on the same settings, if increasing flow reduces respiratory rate, you're going to have an improvement in your ROCS index because it's the denominator. Um, so this is a study, again, published by um, a group in Italy looking at high flow nasal cannula higher than 60 liters per minute in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. So can we give even higher flow, hoping to generate more pressure or more anatomical washout? Now, this value down here is a little bit confusing because this 0.51 and 1.5 are liters per kilogram of predicted body weight per minute. I'm not sure why they chose that for their graph because I've never calculated flow to a patient based on this. But just so you know, the average values for 0.5 here is 30 liters per minute. The average value here is 65. So the one in the middle at one is 65 is the average flow. And the final one on the right, which is 1.5 liters per kilogram of predicted body weight per minute, it's even a mouthful to say, that one, the average flow was 100 liters per minute. And this is a comfort score that you can see at 100 liters per minute, there's a significant drop in comfort with patients. And that was the issue they found that although, of course, you can turn the flow up as high as you want on a device that allows you to do it, but comfort starts to be diminished and many patients complain. Having said that, there was another study, and I should point out the study, I just skipped slides. This one here was done on patients. This study I'm about to show you was done on healthy volunteers. So, the, so there's that aspect that could explain some of the differences, but what they did to get high flows, and they also went up to 100 liters per minute, they they basically doubled up on humidification which may be why in this study they found that patients or 
volunteers tolerated it and they weren't, um, they did not complain of comfort. So humidity or again, increasing the humidification of the gas at higher flow rates may be an important point in the tolerability of excessively high flows. And there are many anecdotal cases out there uh, of patients treating COVID-19 or hospitals or clinicians treating COVID-19 patients with very high levels of flow, again, greater than 60 liters per minute. One of the reasons why some of the devices out there on the on manufacturing, for example, the OptiFlow made by Fisher and Pycal, um, they limit their flow recommendation to 60 liters per minute because above that, they know that, they're, they're, that their humidifier will have insufficient the, the ability for the humidifier to properly condition the gas becomes diminished when the flow is above 60. So that's why in this study, they doubled up the humidification to try to make it more effective. And they found that patient, again, I should say healthy volunteers tolerated it. It made a difference between this study and the previous one. One was on patients, one was on healthy volunteers. It would be an interesting point to find out whether or not the addition of added humidity is beneficial in patients as well rather than healthy volunteers. Um, so people have looked at the ROX index uh, during or in treating COVID-19 patients. They found that a ROX index in this study here, um, this is just a research letter. So these are not large randomized trials. These are research communications, research letters published in journals. They found that a ROX index at four hours, greater than or equal to 5.37 was predictive of success. Again, they're predicting success with this value. The overall, um, Diagnostic accuracy, the area under the curve was 0.75. Sensitivity was 0.66. Specificity was 0.83. Again, for this one value, the balance between the, the optimal sensitivity and optimal specificity, which also is associated with your area under the curve here. Again, they found good diagnostic accuracy, something to consider. It's slightly higher than the 4.88 that has been, um, that was used or discovered with the ROX index trial. There is also another paper, again, that was a research article or letter, open access, the application of high flow um, nasal cannula in hypoxemic patients with COVID-19. Again, looking at the ROX index, finding out whether or not are they able to, uh, again, accurately predict success or failure. If you look at the middle graph here, here at two hours, the ROX index has an area under the curve that is not very good. It's 0 0.560. At six hours, it's much uh, improved. So you can see now it's in an acceptable range of area under the curve, 0 0.78, 0 0.74 for uh, SpO2 divided by FO2 and PO, PO2 divided by FO2. But the ROX index itself at six hours, the ROX index itself is 0 0.79. And then at 12 hours, it's 0 0.82. And at 24 hours, it's 0 0.87. So at six hours, it becomes acceptable and almost excellent. It's at 0.798. If you rounded all that up, you'd be at 0.8. And at 12 hours, um, it's definitely a, got good predictive value. So in their conclusion, they found that a ROX index at hours at six hours was um, greater than 5.55 was predictive of success. So in terms of avoiding reintubation, um, we, we know that high nasal cannula, this is based on a recent systematic review and meta-analysis, high nasal cannula compared with conventional oxygen therapy or non-invasive ventilation. Um, they found that whether you provide high nasal cannula um, or um, non-invasive ventilation, <clears throat> that if you compare standard O2 to high nasal cannula, again, this is the, the top part of the forest plot here. You can see the black diamond is on the left. It favors high nasal cannula. When you compare, compare high flow nasal cannula to non-invasive ventilation, there is no significant difference. So the second black diamond down the screen, it crosses one, meaning overall, when you compare high flow to non-invasive, there's not a difference in terms of reintubation. So either one would be a good choice. Um, having said that, there is now more data looking at what about combining high flow with non-invasive ventilation, and they looked at combining post-extubation in high-risk patients, so those are likely to fail. So this would be a good idea for COVID-19 patients. Um, once they get to the point of extubation, there's been many reports around the world of a high level of reintubation rates in these patients. So extubating directly to high flow compared to directly extubating to high flow uh, with non, so directly extubating to non-invasive ventilation and when they take breaks, using high flow nasal cannula in those breaks. So combining the two therapies actually was significantly better at reducing the reintubation rates and particularly in patients with a PCO2 greater than 45, which is the graph on the left. You can see that's where the huge difference was between high flow nasal cannula alone and the combination of the two.
So in summary, non-invasive ventilation or non-invasive respiratory support for COVID-19, both high nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation have not been shown to increase aerosols. They can, however, disperse them and other oxygen delivery devices have similar effects. Uh, the first line of defense should be high nasal cannula. A short trial of non-invasive ventilation is acceptable. However, the effectiveness should be evaluated in a short period of time, so 30 minutes up to one hour. Consider respiratory rate, work of breathing, and of course, the level of FiO2 being delivered to the patient. Consider the scores that I mentioned. If you're using high nasal cannula, consider looking at the ROCS index. If you're using non-invasive ventilation, again, calculating a HACOR score within one hour might be something of useful, um, might be something useful to the clinician at the bedside. Consider the effects of delaying intubation. And then for avoiding reintubation, high nasal cannula may be superior, uh, particularly in patients that now have a high level of CO2 after their time on the ventilator. So this is how you can contact me on Twitter and Facebook. You can find me at Resource. If you do the TikTok thing, you can also find me at Resource on TikTok. Um, I am the editor for the Center of Excellence in Mechanical Ventilation blog at comv.ca. And before we get into the question and answer, um, I'm going to hand things back over to Dean. Thank you very much uh, for an excellent presentation, Tom. I'm sure we, I know I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone on the program uh, learned uh, a lot from that. Again, let me uh, go over with you how you can get your continuing education credits. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour. And here you may want to jot down this web address if you have a pencil and paper nearby. To obtain continuing education credits, go to www.saxtesting.com forward slash BL. Again, that is www.saxtesting.com forward slash BL. You will need to register at the site and complete the evaluation. And upon successful completion, you will be able to print your certificate for completion. And again, a thank you for Phillips for supporting this educational activity. An archive on-demand version will be available on betteroutcomes.org. I saw there were some questions about uh, the references that were on some of the slides and uh, being able to look at the slide deck again and so forth. So you may want to go to the archive version to help with that. An email will be sent to all registrants when it is available. The on-demand version will be accredited for nurses and respiratory therapists. So Tom, we have time for just a few questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one question is, uh, uh, Cheryl says that at her facility, they use N95 masks for patients on invasive, non-invasive, and high-flow nasal cannula. Do you think they should also be used for any patient on any oxygen delivery device, like say cannula, three or four liters per minute? So I think based on the information that I've been able to uh, discover online, I definitely would consider wearing um, optimal N95 protection around patients that are again because the aerosol generation is not increased but the dispersion is and really on any o2 device you're not really at uh, an advantage being on nasal cannula compared to high flow nasal cannula so i would definitely consider wearing an n95 because uh, we know surgical masks are not perfect filters so there's aerosol in the air from the patient just from speaking and coughing and of course any device will disperse them more um, doesn't generate more aerosols but it can disperse them and some of the therapies at high flow can make some of the particles smaller, doesn't make more of them, but I definitely would filter better. It, this is my personal or humble opinion. I'm not sure what you think, Dean, but. What about, what about having the patient wear a surgical mask, such as a patient who is on high flow nasal cannula? Does that help? So we, we have instructed patients to do that. Uh, not all patients are comfortable doing that, particularly if they're in, in a bit of respiratory distress. Uh, at first, when we apply the therapy, some people can feel a little bit claustrophobic placing that over top with the high flow. Uh, but we have done that and patients that tolerate it, it's, it's, it makes us feel better. It definitely would help to, again, that dispersion would be much, it would be minimized quite, quite significantly by wearing a surgical mask by the patient as well. Um, I still would consider if you're doing close contact with the patient, um, probably want to be as protective as possible for yourself as well. 
A, uh, a practical question that came up, and I've been asked this question myself a number of times, does it help if you have a patient on a high flow nasal cannula, say at 50 liters per minute, and their oxygenation is not very good, can you add a non-rebreather mask on top of the high flow nasal cannula? Does that help or is that a waste? So you can, absolutely, because if someone, you have to consider that the flow going into the nose is 55 liters per minute. Although it minimizes um, the ability for them to entrain room air, it's very possible, particularly if they're breathing through the mouth, that they could be entraining some room air, um, which would diminish some of the effect of the FiO2. So providing a normal breather mask on top of that would basically provide as much oxygen as you could possibly give the patient. Uh, just keeping in mind that if you, you know, if your flow to the patient or your FiO2 going through the nasal cannula is 80% and you put a non-rebreather mask on and it's flush, just consider that now they're on probably a significantly higher dose of O2 and that should play into it in terms of their severity. Okay, I have one final question before I turn the program back over to Monica. You discuss things like the HACAR score and the ROX index, and I, I agree with the, you, these can be very helpful. Many of us at the bedside might not be able to do the math that's involved when there's a lot going on and we have to stop and calculate things and so forth. Uh, do, do you uh, know, has anyone incorporated this into the electronic medical record or is this something that could be incorporated into the EMR so that we uh, don't need to get out our calculators at the bedside and remember the equations and so forth? So I don't know personally of a hospital that has implemented it. Is it possible? 100% because this is data that is collected um, and input into charts. And that's the beauty of the HACOR score and the ROX index in particular is that these are charted values. They're, they don't require um, a specific, uh, well, the HACOR score has oxygenation on there. Um, and I believe it's PaO2. Uh, it has acidosis for pH, but for the ROX index, this is something that should be added to every, just as, because it's easy. It's saturation, respiratory rate, and FiO2. And if you're documenting those three things, and I know it's feasible. I've worked with systems before where we were able to calculate our own scores. Um, so I, for sure, it's it's got to be available or possible. All right, great, Tom. I think I'm going to turn the program back over to Monica before they turn the lights off on us here. And Monica can finish out the program. Thank you so much. We did have one question on uh, just how to see the archived version again. Everyone is very happy with this presentation. It was outstanding, gentlemen. So on your screen is once again the uh, on-demand version available on betteroutcomes.org. Better That's better, B-E-T-T-E-R hyphen outcomes, O-U-T-C-O-M-E-S dot org. Thank you so much. And this um, we thank you for your opinions today, all of our, uh, our attendees. This does conclude our webinar for today. I'd like to remind the audience that there is a survey for you at the conclusion that will pop up immediately, and we do appreciate your feedback and any comments that you would like to make on today's webinar. Thank you again. Uh, another recommendation is if you want to download the handouts, they are at the bottom of your screen. If you scroll down in the slide deck, you can see right under the slide deck, way down there is a, a handouts tab that you can click on that and go ahead and download the, the slides from today. Thank you so much again. And on behalf of our presenters, Sachs Healthcare Communications and our sponsor, Philips, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.